I think today it's a great day for science. Uh, uh, we find an agreement between all six parties that the site of the ITER, that's the fusion building, will be in uh, South France in Kadarash. Uh, I think it's a very important agreement. It's important that we reached it uh, with all six parties in an international uh, environment because this is somehow setting a course also for the future how the cooperation on the scientific field should be done in the cases like this and also broader. During this century, the world's population will double. From 6 billion people today, it will rise to 10 billion by 2050. More importantly, on average, we will be using a lot more energy in the world than we do today. Energy consumption will probably be about two times higher by the middle of the century with an even stronger increase in electricity consumption. To meet the future demand, combustion of fossil fuels may well be used increasingly, with, as we already know, dramatic consequences on the climate due to emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. As this table shows, oil, gas and coal are the most commonly used sources of energy at present. Under these circumstances, developing and improving new, sustainable and renewable sources of energy is therefore crucial for the future. Fifty years ago, nuclear fission power plants were developed which presently contribute about 35% to European electricity production. Today, solutions for the waste issue of nuclear fission are being investigated and new and renewable energy sources are being developed. All sources of energy for the third millennium must take account of environmental requirements, operational safety and availability of resources. All European member states and countries associated with the Eurotom fusion program are well aware of this. Indeed, Europe has become the world leader in research on a new sustainable source of environmentally benign energy that does not emit any greenhouse gases, fusion. Fusion is the sun's source of energy. The heat and light we receive on Earth originate from these fusion reactions. Part of the energy produced remains inside the sun and generates a temperature of 10 million degrees Celsius. This very high temperature, coupled with the gravitational forces and the density of the sun, causes fusion. Under these conditions, hydrogen atoms become separated into their fundamental components, electrons and nuclei, which are then independent of each other and form a new state of matter called plasma. Finally, the nuclei fuse, producing helium and giving off energy. Today, scientists can reproduce this process on Earth. The nuclear fusion process refers to the merger of two light nuclei, hydrogen and hydrogen. This gives an atom of helium. But the two hydrogen nuclei have a positive charge. They don't want to merge. So, we force them. When they are very close to each other, they fuse, and this gives off an enormous amount of energy. How can we force fusion of two nuclei by using a device to attempt to reproduce conditions in the sun? This is not easy. In the sun, this process requires a temperature of 10 million degrees Celsius. If we were to try to achieve it on the Earth, it would need 150 million degrees Celsius. So how do we do it? I'll show you. We take a glass tube with gas in it and we heat it in a special microwave oven. This is the first essential step to achieve fusion on Earth, heating the gas to a very high temperature by means of an external supply of energy so that it becomes a plasma. I showed you that with a microwave oven, I could heat the gas until the atoms split and become charged particles that consequently emit light. But we cannot reach very high temperatures by this means, because the particles touch the side of the test tube and cool down. So we must develop a system to keep them from touching the tube. To do that we have another experiment using a magnetic field to attract the plasma and prevent it from touching the tube. So this is the second indispensable step, preventing the plasma from dispersing and cooling. In the Sun, this tendency is counterbalanced by the force of gravity. On Earth, confinement by gravity is impossible, so the solution is magnetic confinement. We can confine the plasma. But how can we maintain an enormous quantity of plasma in a reactor? Can we really make it float using a magnetic field? The answer is yes. Materie op te hangen 
in the lucht we can suspend it in the air in contact is where it does not touch anything at all This too we do in a reactor, but the tool is plasma. And since the plasma does not touch the sides, we can heat it very, very hot. In a reactor, the plasma is confined in a very stable way in a donut shape called a torus. You may think this shape is a strange one, but it's one of the shapes accepted in nature. Let me demonstrate with this box that blows smoke rings when I tap the back. This smoke ring shows how the toroidal shape can be propagated through space without any exchange with the environment. We use the same principle in a fusion reactor. A torus is a very stable shape. If plasma is confined to this shape, we can maintain the heat with no loss to the exterior. On combining all these principles, a fusion device looks like this. This is what is called a tokamak, and this is the inside of the device.